So this is a, a slips. I don't know if you guys are part one or part two compared to the other. We'll say you guys are part one. Because <laughs> we had another design team who did slips technology over in, in Cambridge. So application of non-stick surface coatings to 3D printers. Hi, everyone. Uh, our presentation is on application of non-stick coating for 3D printer nozzles. Um, can you? My name's Eric. I'm Erica. And I'm Bill. So first we're just going to go over an outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the motivation for a project, and then I'm going to go to the background of the technology. Then we're going to talk a bit about our process in more detail and the safety associated with it. And then we're going to talk about um, the market analysis, our business model, and an economic analysis of our system. And then finally we're going to talk about our experimental results and our remaining challenges and recommendations. So the motivation for our project. Additive manufacturing is becoming a rapidly expanding industry. It's becoming more and more common for companies and people at home to use uh, 3D printers to rapidly prototype parts. And the end goal for 3D printing is to be able to uh, manufacture finished goods instead of just rapid prototyping. So unfortunately there's some limitations that have to be addressed before it's like a go-to manufacturing technique for finished products. And these basically fall into two categories. There's material performance and quality issues, as well as system limitations. Um, and an example of a system limitation would be like the geometries that can and can't be printed. But one really common quality, material quality issue that people experience is known as drool. So you can see in that bottom picture, drool is the cobweb-like strands of polymer that kind of span over finished parts. So what causes drool? I'm going to talk about a bit about how a 3D printer works. Basically, you have a spool of plastic filament, and it gets pulled into a printer head by an extruder motor. And it's melted and then extruded through um, the printer nozzle onto the heated bed. And it builds up layers of plastic until your part is formed. Um, during this process, both the printer head and the heated bed move around. And there's parts during uh, the prints where the um, printer head has to relocate without printing. So when that occurs, the extruder motor pulls back a little bit on the filament, so plastic does not drip out. But unfortunately, uh, the printer nozzle tends to stick to whatever plastic was just printed and drag it around the part. So that's what causes drool. Why is it important? Well, uh, basically it means that prints need to be cleaned after they're printed. And if the end goal is for uh, it to be a completely automated manufacturing process and, or manufacturing tool um, that creates finished products, then we should be able to eliminate drool and not have someone have to clean every single part. There's also waste associated with drool. Um, while it may not be like as much, a lot of uh, plastic wasted per part, when you consider the scale of 3D printing, it uh, can actually add up to a lot of material wasted. Just to give you an idea of scale, 250,000 3D printers were sold last year alone and that number is projected to double this year and continue doubling for the years to come. So it's a pretty big scale process. And the last problem associated with drool is that sometimes uh, the problem is so bad that, um, and if the geometry or shape and size of the part doesn't allow for it to be cleaned, it has to be scrapped altogether, which is a problem because sometimes it can take up to 24 hours to print a part, and so that's just wasted time and material. So our solution to this problem is coated printer nozzles. Um, the drool can be eliminated if the printer nozzle doesn't stick to the plastic that was just printed. So the coating that we are going to coat these nozzles with is known as SLIPS. SLIPS stands for li uh, Slippery Liquid Infused Porous Surfaces. Basically, they're surfaces that are omniphobic, super slippery, and they are uh, developed by a company called SLIPS Technologies. So now I'm just going to talk a bit about the technology background of, of this uh, surface coating. SLIPS is basically a class of omniphobic surface coatings um, that's classified by uh, immobilizing a liquid layer over a surface of material in a, in a kind of porous um, coating. Um, what's interesting about it is that the lubricant that's immobilized in the layer can actually, the molecules can actually move around within the layer, and it basically uh, maintains really high lubricity, omniphobicity, and also healing properties. Um, yeah. So one specific coating that SLIPS developed was developed for steel. 
Um, this process was a three-step process. The first step was the electrochemical deposition of tungsten oxide, and this formed a porous surface coating over the steel. Uh, the second step was surface activation using a fluorosurfactant. This basically functionalized the surface so that when the next step occurs, which is uh, lubrication application, um, capillary action kind of sucks the lubrication into the surface, and the intermolecular interactions kind of keep it trapped there. So that formed an omniphobic surface. Um, as you can see in the picture, uh, it's really cool. Those are liquid droplets kind of sitting on the top of the surface. Um, stable through 300 degrees Celsius, which basically covers the whole range of um, operating temperatures for printing plastics. Um, it's also very durable, and it's, as I said, self-healing, which is important because there are certain filaments that are kind of abrasive for printer nozzles. And um, the last thing is, most 3D printer nozzles are actually made out of brass. So the goal of our company would be to um, apply this process to a different surface coating. So on the next slide, we're going to talk about um, how we went about that. We basically outlined a set of experiments to verify that this process could work on brass. The first thing that we wanted to look at was just coating a piece of brass with tungsten oxide and looking at that, comparing it to what the slips coating looked like. Uh, then we were going to just try and coat a nozzle to make sure that the geometry of a nozzle didn't affect the surface coating. Then we were going to um, coat two nozzles at once, kind of like in an array, they're attached, um, so that would act as one electrode, and that was just to verify um, that our scale-up technique would be effective. And then lastly, we would want to apply the surfactant solution and lubricant to the nozzles to verify that it does actually work how um, slips detailed it. So later on in the presentation, we're going to go over the experiments that we actually did carry out and the results that we found. Okay, so now we'll discuss our process. So this is a six-step process uh, with three unit steps and three drying steps. The first um, is the electrode deposition of the tungsten oxide, um, following by a deionized water rinse and a dry in air. Um, then is the application of the surfactant and a vacuum drying step after that to prevent um, chemical reaction while drying. Um, and then is the application of the lubricant, which is drip dried over the bath. Um, we chose a manual batch process to keep our process small. Um, we're only looking for startup, uh, a startup business. So we've got the plating line, um, the drying step, the hot water bath with a surfactant, um, a vacuum dryer, a vessel for the lubricant, um, and then a drip drying step. Um, the most critical step is the first one, the electrochemical deposition. Um, electrochemical, electrochemical deposition uh, occurs when you add two electrodes into an electrolyte solution. Um, electrons are, well, electrical current runs from the cathode to the anode, and as electrons enter the solution at the cathode um, interface, they reduce the metal salts and cause a deposition of the metal onto the surface. Um, doo -doo -doo. In our process, a reference electrode is necessary. Um, and for us, the cathode would be the entire ray of, a nozzle, of nozzles rather than a single nozzle. So for the electrode deposition, uh, we need a plating bath. Um, this will take about 460 liters of deionized water. Um, and it has a 0.5 molar concentration of sodium tungstate dihydrate, um, which is about 75 kilograms for this bath. This bath is used um, for the process. It's part of the working capital. It's a large um, investment for the bath itself. But as you'll see in later slides, the usage in each deposition is very small. Um, so the current is applied by a potentiostat, which can vary the current. Um, and it's pulsed um, in a square waveform, which is 10 seconds on and 10 seconds off, basically, um, at negative 1.5 volts. Um, this forces the crystals to deposit in layers rather than simply growing, because if you have like, a continuous current, um, the crystals will deposit, and then the structure will continue to grow um, over the course of the uh, applied voltage. Um, we're looking for a specific geometry with this deposition so we can induce capillary action when uh, applying the lubricant. 
So here uh, you can just see the um, SEM images of the slips paper and ours. Um, we'll go into the results and uh, discussion of this later, but you can see there are differences between the two. Um, they have a much more ordered structure, though the island morphology that's talked about in the paper is shown here. Um, so after the application of the tungsten, uh, surfactant is used. Uh, Capstone FS3100 was chosen for us, um, was chosen uh, for this process. FS100 was outlined in the paper. However, uh, since 2012, EPA guidelines have changed and now FS3100 is what the company produces. Um, this is a proprietary chemical formula and it enables the immobilization of the lubricant through chemical forces on the surface. Um, the surfactant solution is only 1% weight of the surfactant held at 70 degrees C um, and the nozzles are dipped for 30 minutes each uh, before being vacuum dried. The lubricant application, um, it's a fluorinated lubricant, uh, Crytox GPL 107. Um, it's highly omniphobic, um, especially when put into the uh, nozzles, put onto the nozzles. Um, for this, the nozzle will just be dipped in the lubricant and then dried over it. Um, and the lubricant should be pulled in by capillary action given we have the right um, coating. They are then drip dried for two hours and that completes the process. Um, they can then be packaged and shipped. Um, this is a table of our total equipment costs. You can see the plating line and the vacuum dryer are the most expensive. However, our um, total equipment cost is very low, only about $40,000 expected. Um, the raw materials are listed here. Um, the price per kilogram is pretty is very good for us. You'll see in the next slide we have very low usage, um, and we have contacted each of these companies about getting some of the materials already. We did purchase the Crytox and the sodium tungstate dihydrate. So this is the material usage. Uh, you can see a very low amount per 1,000 you know, nozzles. The surfactant ends up being so high because we've chosen to dump the baths each, um, each time to maintain the proper concentration in the baths. Um, for the to sodium tungsten dihydrate, the uh, plating solution, we plan to titrate after um, every three to five batches uh, so that we can get the concentration back to 0.5 molar. Um, consistently. But like I said, there's just a working capital um, that's built into the bath. Um, we won't have to like replace the bath, we'll just uh, add more sodium tungstate as it's required. Um, as you can see, this brings our total costs in year one to about $2,000 and by 2019 when we've ramped up production success uh, a lot, uh, only about $12,000. Next, we'll discuss the safety of the reactants used. Um, so the sodium tungstate dihydrate uh, can be hazardous in case of skin contact, eye contact, or inhalation. Um, it forms an acid when put into solution, um, but it's long flammable and it has a low reactivity hazard. Um, the surfactant FS3100 is arguably the most dangerous thing that we have. Um, it was recommended by the manufacturer to use a respirator while handling it. Um, it's hazardous in case of skin contact, eye contact, inhalation, and ingestion, but again is non-flammable and uh, low reactivity. The Crytox GPL um, is only dangerous in eye contact, inhalation, and ingestion, um, and deposition, or decomposition only occurs above 500 degrees Fahrenheit, so this shouldn't be, inhalation shouldn't be a problem. Um, the lubricant is non-flammable and chemically inert. Um, because of these safety issues, PPE like safety goggles, lab coats, and gloves must be worn by all um, individuals handling the chemicals. And um, however, due to the process and lack of automation, equipment failure is not a direct threat to safety at any time. So now we're gonna talk about our market analysis. So as Erica mentioned earlier, uh, about 250,000 printers were sold in 2015 and this number is estimated to double through 2019, ultimately coming to 5.6 million units. Uh, based on our conversations with 
um, industry members, nozzles are replaced roughly twice a year due to mechanical clogging. Um, and this is likely to increase as the printers that are being sold will be sold to industry and they'll be used more often than printers being sold to universities and things like that. Um, and our goal is to capture about 1% of the market. In 2017, this is represented by 27,400 nozzles, or 91 per day. And in 2019, it's 141,000 nozzles, or 470 per day. So here's a graph showing the exponential growth of the market. So now onto the business model. So we looked at two potential business models. The first, we would be an aftermarket reseller of 3D printer nozzles. We would purchase nozzles from manufacturers, coat them, and then sell them to industry and retail consumers. The second business model, we would be a service provider to the 3D printer manufacturers. The manufacturers would supply the nozzles and pay to have them coated. The nozzles would be coated, returned to the manufacturers, and installed in new machines and sold to industry and retail. So we decided to go with business model two. This allows us to capture more of the market as we can include new uh, machines being sold. Uh, in addition, it's lower risk. We, re we are required to hold less inventory and we do not need a, as large of a facility. Well, in addition to this, we don't worry about selling directly to consumers. We can focus on targeting um, the manufacturers, which will result in higher, higher volume. So on to the economic analysis. So here is our ISBL and OSBL costs, uh, which were determined using a factorial method for a solids processing facility found in Towler and Sinope. Uh, so as Eric mentioned earlier, our equipment cost was about $40,000, and using this factorial method, we determined our total fixed capital cost to be about $184,000. Here's our projected revenue based on a selling price of $750 per unit. Um, at, in 2017, that would result in a gross, uh, gross revenue of 202000 and in 2019, this would be expected to increase to $1,057,000. Uh, as we said earlier, significant market growth is expected in the next few years, and in our calculations, um, we assumed no growth after 2019, as these numbers were not reliable for estimates. So here we have our fixed and variable costs of production. Our main variable costs are utilities and raw materials, um, and our fixed costs are labor and maintenance. So for our maintenance, we assumed a 3% of the ISBL, and for the raw materials were calculated uh, based on usage. Um, we expect a 500% increase in production from 2017 to 2019, so that's why you'll see the raw materials go up from about 2,300 to 11,900. Uh, our water consumption is minimal, so the bulk of that cost is actually service charges for the, from the utility provider, so that's why that's a small increase there. And we expect the electrical consumption to double between uh, 2017 and 2019 when we're at full capacity. So here are our net present value and internal rate of return numbers for 10, 15, and 20 years. And with an NPV of at least 2.1 million and an IRR of 292, we consider this to be economically viable. So now we'll discuss um, some of our experiments uh, further. So the first experiment we did was just to coat some brass with the tungsten. Um, we weren't sure whether or not this was going to apply to the surface. There were um, some questions that Professor Podlaha Murphy um, so graciously helped us with. Um, but we were successful in depositing it, and you can see <coughs> the deposition here versus the other brass. You can also see that um, some of the surface morphology is present um, here already uh, on an optical microscope. Um, the next experiment we did um, was to coat one of the nozzles. This unfortunately didn't come out as well as we'd hoped. There was a good deposit on one half, but you can see here um, it became uneven around the other side. Um, this suggests there might be improper agitation. Um, a rotoscope was used, which rotates the cathode in the bath. Um, and it could also be due to um, where the nozzle is facing, or the direction of the nozzle and the cathode, or the anode. Um, if they're facing each other, that side gets more deposition than the other side that's not facing them. Um, yeah, go ahead. 
Um, so this is a, some pictures of our nozzle under the SEM. Um, you can see here there's kind of a distinct boundary between these two um, sections. And here it is zoomed in further. On the left, we have a deposition that we're, we were kind of hoping for. You know, it's got the, the cracks. Um, and it's lighter under the SEM. That means that it um, is a little bit less conductive. Um, and on the right side, we have these crystal structures. Um, we, we were unsure why, uh, we still are unsure why this um, occurred and if this occurred during the deposition or um, after in the drying step. Next. Um, but this is um, a little bit more analysis of the tungsten um, side. You can see that it's hard, I wish these were a little bit blown up, but this is tungsten, this peak here, and this is oxygen. We were looking for tungsten oxide, which is um, a 3 to 1 ratio of oxygen to tungsten, so this looks um, good for us. Um, you can also see the peak in the middle is zinc and copper, which are the components of brass. Um, yeah, next. Here, uh, the crystalline surface. Again, tungsten oxide is definitely present. Um, the amplitude of all these um, of all these peaks is larger, though, so the coating may be thicker here. Um, there's also a more pointed uh, peak here, which we think might um, be sodium. However, the sodium peak overlaps almost exactly with the zinc and the copper, so it's hard to tell how much there might be on the surface at that time. Um, so now we're going to talk about uh, remaining challenges and recommendations. So first we would like to test and optimize the deposition process. We need to follow up with why we had this uneven coating. Um, then we want to test different agitation methods. At this scale it was not practical to test those methods just because of the small volume of the solution. Uh, then we need to test the effects of thermal cycling because these nozzles will be heated up and cooled down repeatedly um, and brass and tungsten have very different thermal expansion coefficients and this will be critical for the life cycle of the product as to how quickly it will wear down and need to be replaced. Um, then we need to test the fluorosurfactant as we're using a replacement and what was not used in the original process. Uh, we couldn't obtain this surfactant because of limitations in the lab due to the fact that it was carcinogenic and required a respirator. Um, also, used equipment may not be suitable. It may need to be repaired or it might have issues that would require extra capital and time. And it was impractical to build the facility right away in year one as we don't know the, the, um, the market demand and it's better to rent a facility for the first few years. Uh, finally, we need to hire a lawyer to work with us in regards to local tax incentives and procedures with setting up the facility. Uh, we would need to negotiate a deal with slips for use of the patent. We would need to negotiate with nozzle manufacturers, and we expect these fees would be upward of $100,000 once all is said and done. Finally, we would like to acknowledge some of the people who helped us with this project. Our industry mentor, Mr. Tom Basalt, Dr. Elizabeth Padlaha Murphy, who donated her lab to our experiments. Dr. Avinash Kola, who assisted us with the experiments. Bill Fowle, who runs the SEM lab and helped us get those photos that Eric showed you earlier. Bill Yurizunas, who was an industry member at uh, Mitsubishi Electronic Research Labs, who discussed the design considerations and constraints when working with 3D printers. And Dr. Xiao Ming Shi and Dr. Thomas Webster, who were our professors throughout this experience. Any questions? We have time for some questions. Uh, yeah. Yes, please. Um, so, given that your um, long term sales projections are largely based on the projected total sales of 3D printers, um, are you concerned at all with the fact that many of the more recent um, higher throughput and more accurate printing technologies are not nozzle based 3D printers? And if so, um, how do you plan to um, expand your projections given that stereolithography will likely overtake novel printing in less than five years? We are looking largely at um, education and consumer markets, which um, 
will still be um, using a lot of these cheaper printers. Um, many of the one of the barriers has been getting printers under you know five thousand dollars or a thousand dollars for consumers. Um, we expect a lot of those to still be nozzle printers. Um, a lot of the forecasts are also skewed um, in favor of or in not in favor of us because um, growth projections include 3D printing for like aviation, which is metal printing technology and is not um, under our umbrella. Yeah, that's one of the reasons we only use the 1% market share and that's what we were expecting to attain. I, uh, I had a question. So it was great that you, you did some experiments to complement your your project. I'm wondering if you could summarize what you learned from those experiments that modified your design project. Um, I know you mentioned some of yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Deposition is very complicated. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, constraints that we hadn't really considered going into them, and just seeing the difference between um, the surface morphology. You know, ours was kind of like you know lumpy and weird and like a more pyramidal structure. Whereas they had, you know, well-defined crystals, um, we had stumbled across um, problems that could be due to pH. We might add buffers into the solution. Um, there could be, um, like we said, the the problem with the agitation. You know, we're not sure how the um, we shouldn't use um, like the lab scale rotoscope, but. Um, it's not clear like what kind of agitation can be used, um, and that wasn't a consideration previously. Yeah. So it sounds like yeah, it sounds like some of the factors that you're highlighting would require, in a real manufacturing sense, pretty strict guidelines when doing deposition. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that yeah, correct? absolutely, definitely. So it would require you to narrow the specs for the manufacturing process. Yeah. I also had a question about drooling, True. which I love that term. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Has there, there must be some study to estimate the additional cost that's associated with drooling? So it's so different part to part. Some parts don't require you to pick up the nozzle and move a lot. Like if it's like kind of a circle that you're building up, it doesn't pick up at all. But other parts like that one, obviously it, it looks like it picked up and moved over like every layer. So it would be kind of hard to estimate exactly how much drool is calculated or um, generated. Cost. Yeah, and also there's so many different types of plastics. When we were um, talking to Bill Yerzunas about 3D printers, he had like 30 different types of plastics like hanging on the wall that he told us about, and they all um, have different properties. So it's kind of hard to estimate exactly how much material is lost, but um, it is a problem. It's also difficult on um like a lot of what's attractive about 3D printing is like decentralization and like given that it makes recycling of the material you know totally impractical because it, you know you're going to be scraping off you have a home use thing a couple grams of this stuff you know save it for a couple months while you get a couple more grams then send it somewhere you know it's um, easier to do this and could save a lot of money yeah did, did you have did anybody actually demonstrate that the slips technology was successful in eliminating drooling? We could not um, get the proper deposition yeah. for this, so we couldn't verify whether or not it was. We also didn't have the surfactant to do the surfactant step, so we didn't get to finish the whole process on a nozzle. But um, based on the properties detailed in the slips paper that is omniphobic, we expect that it would definitely work. If you, if you had the right coding, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, that, yeah. that would if be the was, recommendation yeah. back to slips is in order for this really to work for 3D printing nozzles, some someone would have to, have to pay more attention to the coding necessary. Mm -hmm. All right. So we should probably, unless there's any more questions, move on to our next presentation. Thank you. Cool.